Hello, 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 and welcome to season four of my podcast, A Pint of Imbecile Wisdom, everyday people with everyday stories and great inspirations for the rest of us. So this year, as I said on my teaser, if you haven't watched it yet, I dropped it last week. I'm talking about leadership and humanity, or rather humanity and leadership, and I see them as being two separate sides of the same coin. So very unlike my previous seasons, I'm actually starting this season with a theme, and the theme is basically humanity and leadership. I'm talking to a lot of corporate guys, so I want to kickstart the season off by talking to my buddy Chris, who has been in the industry for the longest time, runs a team that is spread globally, so he's got a great insight into cultural diversity, and he's been able to read people, to read their leadership skills, and so forth. So we are talking about leadership, we're talking about diversity, and at the end, we're also talking about the change in the world, you know, the voice of Asia and the African Union, you know, what does that mean for us in Asia, what does it mean for our counterparts in the Western world, and how is that changing the dynamics of leadership? So, as I said, welcome to the podcast, welcome to Humanity and Leadership Talks, and let's get started with episode one. And I'm talking to my buddy, Chris. Let's talk. Hello, 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 and welcome to my podcast, A Pint of Invisible Wisdom. This is Tagore, and as you know, my podcast is all about everyday people with everyday stories, but great inspirations for the rest of us. My guest today is interesting. We're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about equality and we're going to talk about the voice of Asia and Africa, for example, which is now gaining more popularity, getting a louder uh, voice on a global platform. So what's, how does this impact the world? When we talk about leadership and equality, how does it impact us? Not only in an organization, but also in our lives as human beings. And what does it mean for our future gen- generations? So. Chris, buddy, welcome to my podcast. Thank you, Tagore. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. Chris, let's start with the, with the basic question. Tell my audience a little bit about yourself. My oh, name is Chris. Uh, I've been here in Singapore for about 23 years now. Uh, originally born in the Netherlands. I have a family in Indonesia. Uh, I have a Chinese background. I am, by all means, a, a mixed bag as a person. And I can relate to the topic that we're talking about. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll get to that over this cup of coffee. So fire away. Oh, thanks, Chris. Good. So let's start off, first of all, with leadership. Um, now, there are lots of books written on leadership. There are people who claim to be leaders. In your humble opinion, as an everyday Joe Bloggs like myself, what does leadership mean to you? Leadership means listening, I think, Tagore. Leadership means listening. Um, if you go through the, uh, the textbooks that I think most of us grew up with, leadership means uh, guiding people, you know, managing people. You tell them what to do and they, they will do as told. Uh, fast forward to today, I think that we're living in, a, in, a, in an environment where you need to leverage the talent that you have in your team, you need to leverage the people that you work with and it starts with listening what what can they bring to the table and uh and kind of to, kind of to your point that is changing as well what people can bring to the table so in short leadership means listening i think okay but you made a very good point there you said you know once upon a time leadership was about managing people telling them what to do and asking them. but don't you think that uh what has always been the case and what differentiates leaders from managers is that managers have always done what you just said, but leaders have influenced people, given them a vision, shown them a path and let them go down that road. Ah, I like what you're saying. What differentiates leaders from the rest of the pack is a leader is expected to have a, a vision. You mentioned the word guidance, right? Um, uh, as a leader of uh, of my team, for instance, right? I have a, a team of approximately 135. 
they're not even in Singapore, they're offshore. Um, and they rely on me to provide a path. And the first question that they would ask is, Chris, we each have our own talents and we each have our own skill sets. Um, what would you like us to do? We have some ideas, but Chris, lead the path. And that's where it starts, I think, there were. Okay, that's that's an interesting point you made there, but as a leader, and you said you know, you've got people across the world, literally. What are some of the cultural challenges that you're faced with as a leader, and how do you overcome that? Okay. So let me caveat the, the, the following uh, with, uh, with a statement saying, I, I will touch on stereotypes. I will touch on stereotypes, uh, but with a purpose. Um, okay, let's start with this. I was born and raised in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands, and, and, and most people will tell you the Dutch people are fairly direct. Tell me if it's wrong. If it's not wrong, tell me if it's not wrong, but don't leave me hanging. Um, if you come to Asia, large parts of Asia, you won't immediately say it's wrong. Take India, for example. And India is a subcontinent, so already I am placing a stereotype there. Um, when I'm in a call with my team and there is a superior in the, in the room, the juniors will highly likely not speak up. Uh, in fact, they would allow um, uh, the, the superior to speak. And, and only afterwards, I find out that there are some ifs and buts there. Nothing wrong with that. But then consider that I have uh, stakeholders in, let's say, Australia. Australians are a bit like Dutch people. Uh, tell me if it's wrong. I, I don't mind, but tell me if it's wrong. The stereotypical Indian person will not do that even if asked for so me being you know a mixed bag of things i asked uh, my i asked my my indian counterparts like um how, how come how come this person is speaking up i know he's a bright guy or how come she is not uh, sharing her opinion and the answer to gore was this chris you need to understand something right in our culture we are taught not to do talk back to our elders and yeah. it starts from young correct and, and that rang a bell and I, I see you're nodding your head right and um, in my household my, my parents were old school Asians regardless of where where from uh, Asia they're, they're from I started work and um, I, 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 I behaved that way I didn't necessarily speak up and I can still recall my very first performance assessment to go Chris, I like the way you work, da, 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 da. But why don't you speak up? Is that an Asian thing? And it, this was not meant as an insult, Tagore. If anything, it was uh, shared, uh, the feedback was shared with me by someone who spent some time in Asia. Is this an Asian thing? I think I said, maybe it is, I don't know. So, so I guess in summary, in closing, and, and there's a lot to be discussed about, which we will do. Right? <clears throat> I think depending on the culture, uh, there are different ways of styles of working, I guess. And it's easy to make stereotypes. Yeah, and it's interesting what you said about, you know, being Asians, we are taught how to respect our elders, not to answer back to our elders. And we kind of tend to carry that on outside of the family life and outside of our culture in, into a corporate world. And I always say, you know, to people, don't mistake silence to be their weakness. You know, sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it's very important to understand that. But in a world that is evolving, and we'll talk about that in a minute, Chris, but in a world that is evol evolving way, uh, certain people from different parts of the world, especially from Asia and Africa, were not given an opportunity, were not used to uh, voicing their opinions, right? And in today's world, we're having leaders like yourself who are looking for a dynamic team, who are looking for talent to come forward and voice... How can we change that culture where, say, someone like yourself can encourage that boy or girl in India that it's okay to, I want to hear your opinion, I want to hear your ideas. What is it that leaders need to do in such situations? Good question, Tagore. Um, three things. 
I'm a person of three, so three things, I think. Number one, when in a call or in a meeting, or even day-to-day -day life, um, proactively ask, I proactively ask, uh, um, so, hey, um, Arun, what do you think of this? Okay. And, and I have uh, permission, if you will, from his superior to draw that out. So. If anything, that's a 1A and a 1B, right? So uh, in, in, in a way, I actually position this this question, this, this, this interest in, in his uh, team member's uh, opinion. I position it to the superior as, hey, allow me to help you get the best out of your team. So he can shine as well, or she can shine as well. I think the second thing is provide a context. So when, when I speak with my team, it is always always within a very specific context of what we do in our work. And so it's very focused. I think the third thing is though, um, recognizing that the, uh, the, the people these days, we have access to social media. We have access to knowledge and understanding ways of behavior styles of management, styles of employee behavior. And so one thing that I'm trying to do, Tagore, is in asking someone's opinion, hey, Arun, what do you think about this? Also encourage them to explore, let them learn. You, you, you mentioned uh, something very valuable and important just now. <clears throat> A lot of us haven't had exposure the outside world haven't had exposure to um, uh, newer ways of management or leadership. Um, they expect the leader to say, they tell them what to do and they will do it. What I'm trying to do, and, and many, many of my acquaintances are trying to do, is to encourage such individuals to explore knowledge. Social media is an interesting thing. You have YouTube, whether it's how to change the tires on your bike or to fix the toilet or what could um, artificial intelligence mean for, uh, I don't know, finance or, 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 or different things. So I guess what I'm trying to do is to open doors and in many ways to go, it, it benefits me as well because I only have 24 hours a day, right? The minus sleep and other other activities what better way to um to expose myself to a new understanding by enabling encouraging my team to do that for the rest of the team and then perhaps even make it something more playful uh, uh whoever comes up with the best idea for this particular problem um uh, deserves a reward Recognition is something that every human being likes. Absolutely. And it, it's interesting. And I'm going to stick with one thing you talked about now. For example, this uh, member of your team in India, Arun. So when you ask him, hey, what did you think about it? Uh, the question is, do you ask him on a one-to-one -one or do you ask him in a, in a team meeting? Because either way, it's actually empowering. And empowering actually is the first step towards equality uh, among Absolutely. people. Yeah. So the question is, how do you handle it with this individual? It, it, you know, the, the one, the one principle I always have in mind is try to not put people on the spot. So, and, and, and this is how I interpret your question, right, Tagore? If I were to ask Arun on the spot with his peers or even his team, and I already know by listening to him, I already know it would be a bit tough for him to provide his perspective or his opinion I will try to avoid that or I will still ask him and tell him you know what you don't need to answer right now we can take it offline yeah um, and, and in doing so at least allow him some recognition by his team members that he does have a perspective and has, has some uh, agency to, to speak up um, we, uh, we were talking about my, my folks in India. Uh, if, if I may take a, a sidestep, Tagore, 
Uh, have you ever heard of if the, the, the Japanese term nemawashi? No, I haven't. Please tell us all what about it. It, it, relate, it relates to your question. Nemawashi loosely translates into the meeting before the meeting. Yeah. Okay. So uh, many of us folks and, and, and many of the listeners uh, may have uh, interacted with uh, Japanese uh, professionals before perhaps in a work setting. And, and many of us, and again, I'll make another stereotype, many Westerners uh, might have uh, noticed that in, in a official meeting, it's very tough to actually draw out a decision. Now, the Japanese way of doing this, the stereotypical Japanese way of doing this, is for, let's say myself, with a proposal, to have maybe a cup of coffee, a cup of tea with some key individuals that I know will be in the meeting or would be influencers to superiors in that meeting. And so uh, I would have conversations to kind of tease out um, what would be the uh, concerns for my proposal. What do you think uh, person A would take away from that? such that I have a meeting within the meeting, uh, before the meeting. In the meeting, I can, you know, put my proposal forward. And there's a higher likelihood to either A, get some uh, thoughtful nods of appreciation for the proposal, or better still, B, uh, to be invited to a, an offline meeting and there could very well be over uh, over a, a, a meal or uh, some sake to actually make the decision. Now, how does this relate to what you just asked to ask me about uh, my team, Arun, or how does this relate to culture? Um, what I just mentioned, nemawashi, is just a Japanese phrase for something that I think a lot of us are doing regardless of whether you're Japanese or not. Mm. Just that inside the Japanese working culture, this this is an institute, it's a thing. And they gave it a name. The moment you give a, give a, a thing a name, it's, it's kind of culturally defined, right? It's like uh, give a chicken a name and instead of it becoming part of dinner, it's actually your pet. You know what I mean? So, and, and this is something that you, you wanted to talk to me about as well, or wanted to exchange thoughts about as well. Uh, the, 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 the influence of culture and the rising uh, prominence yeah, of, of Asia on the world stage, be it in entertainment or in business or otherwise. Exactly. Right? So I hope to have provided a bit of a segue to some of the other things that you wanted to exchange thoughts about. So, you know, I was listening to you, Chris, I was just thinking, managers think that they know it all, yeah? And they push back that knowledge down onto their team, not giving, often not giving people the ability to think for themselves, to come up with new ideas. Whereas a leader doesn't believe that he or she knows everything and actually encourages their team members to share the wisdom, share ideas, share proposals. Yeah. Uh, I think, especially in today's day and age, Chris, when we have whatever you want to call them, Gen Z, or I, I, I don't know what they're called, but you have these young kids, just early 20 year old kids coming into the workforce, yeah? Regardless of their gender, I noticed that they've got it right. They've actually been able to differentiate what's work and what's outside of work. So they come in nine to five or nine to six, they give it everything that they want to, they want to enjoy it, but after six o'clock, they want to go home and they want to actually embrace their life outside of work. I think leaders encourage their teams to have that. Whereas managers wouldn't give a damn about it, right? My question here to you, Chris, is do you think that the leaders of today are realizing the change in these team members that they're getting in? from a different generation, with a different mindset, with a different soul. And how should leaders say of our age, 
uh, be evolving to get the best out of this? Uh, I'm happy that you asked the question. Um, I think I think many, um, let's say managers, right? Many managers recognize that the um, behavior and appetite for, let's say, work-life balance of no, the next generation. Uh, sorry, not managers. Many leaders would do that. M managers won't do it, in my opinion. I do stand corrected. I do stand yeah. corrected. So many leaders would actually recognize uh, the, the evolution. Yeah. And many leaders would actually recognize and understand even um, the, the changing appetite of the next generation. I think what's what's challenging though is that understanding is one thing, Tagore. How to respond or proactively act on that is yet another. I can understand that it's uh, not useful to let me think of an example. Uh, I can understand it's not useful to, to, to smoke a lot. And then let's say that I'm a habitual smoker, but it's just so tough to unlearn that. Now, smoking is a bit of an extreme example. I, I, I grant you that. But I think even leaders, even leaders, we grew up uh, with, with certain uh, mindset with certain thoughts. Instinctively, it's, it's almost muscle memory. Instinctively, we think from that perspective. I guess what I'm suggesting is that, well, you just corrected me rightfully so, uh, there's, a, there's managers, there's leaders. I think there's yet another level of awareness there, uh, or maybe skills that Tagore. Leaders who actually have a vision and understanding of how to act on their understanding. Yeah. Let's say work from home, right? Yeah. Um, many or there's a whole cohort of, of uh, fresh grads that uh, graduated or found their first job uh, in the past two years when the world and the corporate world just started coming out of the, the work from home uh, type of situation. You need to work from home because, you know, COVID. Yeah. Um, since last year, many companies have started uh, thinking about hybrid working. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, okay, despite the fact that a lot of companies are going back to, to, to the office uh, now, there's all cohort that, that started working last year. They're not used to working from the office five days or six days a week. And actually, I need to I need to correct myself. With larger employers asking their employees to come back and work from the office five days a week, the younger cohort, the last year's cohort, might have a bit of a challenge with that. They were comfortable having, you know, wearing a shirt and their their shorts uh, underneath. Uh, they were comfortable, they grew up using uh, Teams or Zoom or what have you to have their meetings and taking certain liberties in multitasking. They're, might I say, not used to uh, having a meeting face-to-face -face in a meeting room with five other people, yeah. whereby it's uh, expected that you pay attention and uh, close your laptop. To just name an example. or there not used to the uh, flexibility of just walking over to your colleague who is sitting at the other desk or cubicle and, and have a, an ad hoc uh, conversation. I guess what I'm trying to say is that whilst leaders know that this generation exists, how do you bring them, you know, how, how do you engage with them? How do you get the best out of them? Before we move on to the next segment, I have one question for you. It's a yes or a no. Are leaders made or are leaders born? I think leaders are made. Leaders are made. Interesting. I actually believe the opposite, but it's interesting to see because everybody that I met as a leader, I believe that I can read the characteristics of the human being. And it seems that they were always this all their life. They showed signs of it in the early parts of their life and you talk to them for a cup of coffee or something. But I think 
I think managers are made. And one other question before we move on. So let's just say uh, Tagore is a gr- is a great salesman, meets all his targets, you know, overachieves on his targets. Does that make him to be a good team leader for the sales team? Are you asking me or are you? I'm asking you. Is Tagore a good ah. candidate to be the team leader? Not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. And I, I think, mean, there's an assumption. Yeah. And I think many companies get it wrong when they take the best performing individual in a certain element and promote them to be something else, which is not really their competencies. Okay, so coming back now to the second part that I wanted to talk to you in the podcast was, and it's somehow connected to leadership as well. But as I said earlier, we've got a new generation of uh, of kids coming in. Uh, we, we've still got dinosaurs like you and me in, uh, in, in the workplace, right? But there has been a huge noise about the woke culture in the world over the past few years. And mm-hmm. uh, rightly or wrongly, there's a lot of people you know, shouting about equality, be it uh, people from a different racial background, religious background, color, or gender, and so forth. How do you think we should embrace this? Because I've seen some companies getting it completely wrong when they're going to give somebody a job because it's either a disabled person or a person of color or a, or a certain gender or because they're transgender, they use the pride thing. Uh, I personally believe, and you know this, I believe very much in equality. So equality is not about tilting from one end of the, of the spectrum to the other. It's about finding equality, finding the right people for the right reason, for the right job. What's your opinion about the influence of such a task force in our world today? And how is it how is it changing our lifestyles? It be it in the corporate world or otherwise? Uh, I find this a really, it, it, it's, it's, it's a really interesting topic. Um, okay, let's take this perspective. Let's say I'm an employer. I'm a, I, I'm a hiring manager. I'll just use the word for what it is and um, I just need the best person for the job. Um, theoretically speaking, I would just I would look at skill sets, I would look at past experience, whether that person in front of me um, has a different color or skin, different color hair, different disposition, it should not matter. It should not matter. Because if I'm, if I got my, if I have my priorities straight, I just want to get the right person for the job. I think the challenge though here is um, Tagore, and uh, I'll probably shoot myself in the foot here. We all grew up with certain, uh, with a certain mindset as well. Um, I grew up with a mindset. So I grew up in the Netherlands actually, right? A lot of um, Caucasians, primarily Caucasians actually. I always thought, and we've had discussions as students, like why can't there be a, a Chinese CEO of Unilever? For those of us who don't know, Unilever is a an Anglo-Dutch yeah. company, right? Um, and, and and we ended up with like it, it will never happen because the the folks who are looking to uh, they were planning their successor or looking at the right profile, uh, even the most open-minded person will never take the risk of hiring a Chinese person. It, it just won't. Which doesn't explain, by the way, that uh, uh, a whole host of multinationals are now led by, let's say, Indian professionals. Coca-Cola, or is it Pepsi-Cola? An Indian lady, Yeah. even. Pepsi. Pepsi, there you go. Yeah. And there are multiple examples. So, uh, there, there, there uh, by the same vein, there's, there, there, there are multiple examples whereby I'm actually happy that there's a, a, a sense of awareness. The, the, the word woke, however, Tagore, it, 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 it kind of concerns me. Uh, I, in, in my, in my, my mind, and I'll speak for myself, woke uh, evokes uh, imagery of protests of 
um, um, entitlement. We have been suppressed for so many centuries. We are now going to take back what's ours. So whilst on the one hand, the true leader uh, recognizes that they, they need to plan for succession or plan for expansion based on the right skill sets, there's also on the other hand, a society or part of the society that, that feels entitled. And I'm going to say this with a little bit of caution, abuses that newfound, newfound awareness that, that, uh, that there is a need for equality. In my opinion, Chris, and I don't know where I sit on this, but I think the woke movement has done what it had to do. It rattled the cage. It made us aware that uh, intolerance of any sort, inequality of any sort is not acceptable. Yeah. But you were talking earlier on about you've got the right, you're the hiring manager, you've got the right person. You're going to choose the right person based on their skill sets. But you know what, Chris, as a leader, You've got a KPI sitting on your head saying you're going to employ X number of, say, I don't know, women or, you know, X number of a, 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 a certain group of ethnic people, whatever it may be. So how does that impact not just you as a leader, but the organization in the long run? Hmm. OK, I want I want to speak for me and my current role. Yeah. But allow me to speak on a more general level. Yep. Um, as one of the things I, 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 I appreciate in, in, in many people is integrity. Yeah. Integrity means having values of your own. Integrity means the courage to stand up for those values, even if, even if it's at your own detriment. So back to your point, let's say that I have a, uh, a KPI that says you need to have X percent uh, uh, a white male uh, staff need to have Y percent female, etc. and so forth. Yeah. Um, do I feel comfortable operating in that kind of environment? Do I feel comfortable operating in an, uh, in an environment that uh, does not align with my values? Do I go to sleep most of the nights? With a, with, with a feeling that I've been able to stand up for my values as opposed to most of the nights I'm like, you know what, I had the perfect candidate, but they just didn't fit the quota. And at that point in time, I think, and again, on a general level, you need to decide what are your personal priorities? Some people might stay in that job and violate their own integrity simply because of the reality of life. They need to bring in the bacon. They need to bring in the, the not the bacon, but they need to bring in the, the income for the family. Whether male, female, female, son, daughter, uh, whatever the, the, the situation of the family is, maybe for practical reasons, reasons, you need to swallow your, not pride, but swallow your integrity. Yeah. But then you need to think like, Okay, so what is it then that I like to do? And what is it then practically what I can sacrifice to not have to live in under these your point KPIs anymore um, and can actually build my own team? And I'd like to think without any facts or figures or statistics, I'd like to think there's a whole host of uh, professionals out there that decided to quit their, their paid job and just set up their own company, start something for themselves with the support of their partner or family or whoever they depend on them and decided that living a fulfilling life, which includes not having to violate your integrity most of the time, is worth much more than X percent of that income. So which brings me now to another question that we roughly touched about during one of our previous exchange of messages, Asia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Asia is finding her voice. You know, China has always been there, you know, but now you look at other countries in Asia, 
You look at the G20 that has just finished in India, where they've made the African Union a permanent member of the of the G20. Yeah, and one of my Caucasian friends said to me, "To God, do you think this is the rest of the world firing up against the West?" And I said, "I don't think so." I said, "That's a very co- colonial thought because by saying that, you feel." that the colonial west should be dictating everything that's happened in the world like they have been doing in the past that their currency is the strongest that they define the strategy they define the plans the road map of things that don't even impact them but impact other parts of the world but now i'm glad that asia is finding its uh, her voice how do you think this is going to change keeping in mind we've got more and more people focusing on being leaders we've got the equality element discussed we've got the work thing discussed what impact is that going to have on the world as a whole yeah it's an interesting question so like yourself i'm happy that asia has become more prominent in different sectors of of industry and in different parts of our life um whether it's um the availability of uh, Huawei or Xiaomi electronics in America and I say America uh, uh all the way through to uh Chinese and 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 you know Japanese becoming part and parcel of a uh, secondary school's curriculum in certain parts of Europe or indeed in again the Americas or even uh, the concept of yoga from India you know going out all over the world and 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 people and people kind of wake up to that realization right so there's that and and with the proliferation of uh, asian multinationals come well there's two things right number one um much like the japanese mnc's of old and of old i refer to the 70s and 80s uh you you will see a lot more expats going from asia to the west and spend some time there uh, and growing their their enterprise and their business um and one might think that overseas asians and i am one of them yeah would think like hey i have a an opportunity here i grew up in the west i've not been heard uh so hey brother and sister coming over with their company i think i have a uh, a step up from caucasian candidates eh, wrong because this guy is not chinese ask any person in shanghai beijing ask anyone here in singapore malaysia and i spent 8 to 9 years in malaysia working uh, out of my 23 years here in southeast asia ask any one of them if they recognize me as chinese indonesian asian they will say no so there's there's that as well tagor that we need to consider yes asia is is finding its voice so but but the question then is whether that voice um whether whether that voice actually benefits uh the brothers and sisters who who were part of the diaspora uh a couple of decades ago second thing just now we discussed how in the let stereotype again in the asian mindset you do not contradict your superior guess what mindset and and the management style not the just a management style many of the mnc's are exporting as they're expanding into the west thou shalt not contradict thy superior and that's a tough one because just now i explained how overseas uh, asians might not be recognized as equals of their asian asian uh, counterparts uh caucasians might not might also not have an advantage because they're not used to that management style in an interview they must fall between the cracks so uh, where does it leave uh, said uh, asian enterprise or multinational that wants to expand into the west it will need to adapt its management style will need to 
become a leadership style, right? And that takes time too. I'm not saying that 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 uh, you know uh, Asian multinationals uh, are, are very stereotypical uh, across the board. All I'm saying is that we have that in our DNA. Uh, we just discussed it. Um, there's an interesting um, 1980s uh, movie, a Hollywood movie, called Gung Ho. It's about yeah. a Japanese company that you know that it, it yep. featured Michael Keaton, I think. Correct. Uh, as a manager of a company that's taken over by Japanese, and he has just have, has a tough time dealing with the uh, early morning exercises in the in the factory yard, in uh, not speaking up during a meeting. So you recognize that. I think this uh, something similar, even though not as character characteristic as the movie, uh, could take place in many multinationals. Um, one of our fellow EGN members, uh, uh, I shall not mention his name without his permission, but he works. He has been working for a Chinese company for the longest time. He and I actually challenged us, challenged each other. Let's let's. Um, improve our Chinese, we'll, we'll do Duolingo. And it's and, and his reason for that was, was valid. He, he, he actually said, I can't force my Chinese co uh, colleagues to switch to English, thereby affecting the efficiency of a, a discussion, even if it's over coffee. So I'd like to at least get familiar with some common phrases and when we meet over coffee, I'll, uh, I'll broach that topic when he is there as well. By the way, he will be there on Friday, so come. Um, I'd like to at least understand whether they're happy or sad about something or whether they're referring to, to something in the work. And so, yes, he's been picking up his Chinese. I, anyway, um, I guess all I'm saying is this, Asia found his voice, but it, it, it's um, establishment. As, as leaders, yeah. uh, and especially in the West, won't happen from one day to the other. Because they're facing the exact same problems that we've been facing. But if, <laughs> what I'm really happy about is that there's so many things happening in Asia. And I'm talking about soft powers, like for example, Korean pop bands are very popular in the West. Ah. Yeah, that's soft power. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier on, yoga from India is now being penetrated even more deeply than before. There's uh, Chinese food has always always been there as everyone's first or second favorite food, uh, you know, in the West. So there is this element of Asia getting more powerful, and that's going to spill over into the day-to-day -day life even more. We're going to be able to see, as you mentioned earlier on. Japanese corporations becoming multinationals like be it the Fujitsu or the Toshibas, for example. But you're going to have more and more organizations coming out of Asia, penetrating into the West as true multinationals. And I hope that happens in our lifetime, but it's definitely going to happen for our kids. And our kids are going to take pride in working for multinationals that, that have origin. And not that it's right or wrong in any way, but they're going to have that opportunity to work for multinational companies that are homegrown locally in Asia. Yeah, I, I I share your sentiment. I would like to add a couple of things, though, uh, to Gore. Um, one of them is um, one of them is as as leaders take their enterprises or their entertainment or whatever to to the West or to other places like South America, for instance, or, or Africa. Yeah. Yep. Um, I've noticed a tendency for individuals to stop identifying themselves as Asian and start identifying themselves as their former colonial overlords. Yeah. There's one, there, 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 there are a couple of examples and, uh, once again, I shall not name them by name, but a, uh, a certain CIO that I uh, worked for some time in the past. Uh, when asked where he's from, literally where, which part of India he's from, his response with a frown was, I'm not from India, I'm from Liverpool. <laughs> and in the back of my mind is like, 
really? Yeah. Yes, you spend, you study there, sure. But do you know your roots? And this is what we're talking about, right, Tagore? Yeah. It's just the proliferation of Asia, but hey, recognize your roots, right? And without without denying who you are. Me, I will, me, it's a different story. I will ne never be recognized uh, as an Asian. You know what? I'm fine with that. When I'm here, I'm the Dutch guy. Full stop, end of story. But I know my roots. Yeah. My kids, and, 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 and you have a daughter, so to your point, right? They identify as Singaporean. Go ahead. My son will need to go through NS. Uh, I, I fear the day that he will, uh, the, the possibility that he will stand up and say, no, I'm Dutch, uh, sorry, no. Or that he speaks with a, uh, yeah, with a non-Singlish accent or something or another, right? Um, so so there, there's so many factors to consider, uh, Tagore, in, in stating, yes, Asia has found its voice. Um, I think for behavior, muscle memory, DNA to wear off, it, it will take a while. I think, the sad part, I think the sad part is, Chris, what you just mentioned about the CIO guy. It's again a, the wiring of a, colonial, a victim of colonialism mindset. You know, they haven't, we haven't kind of got over that yet. You know, um, the invaders have left and gone. But uh, what they've left behind is something far deeper rooted in us than we realize. Okay. Uh, we expect to be slaves still, and they, even in today, expect to be the superior race. And that goes not just for white people against colored people, but it goes across the board as well, from people who have invaded from Japan and to other countries. It, it, it just works in that way. And we as leaders, as, society, as humanity, have got to raise our kids to understand that, that it's wrong and keep them away from that mindset as much as possible you know it's all in the wiring it's all in the wiring it's called uh, i was talking to a psychologist about a year ago and she said it's all imprints in the back of our mind we don't realize we have it but when we react to things our imp impulse straight away goes back to that and saying oh you know this is what has been planted yeah. into me and i need to get it and that's how i need to behave you know, and, and, and it's I I, I I experience this on a on a on a, on a daily basis to go uh, this this behavior. Um, I mean, let me ask you, right? And then kind of turn the tables. Me being the interviewer and you being I love it. It's a conversation, right? The coffee conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um. So so so. Let's say uh, that that you observe the situation, uh, work-wise or otherwise, um, whereby one party clearly behaves as the as as his DNA or her DNA programming. I shall not speak up, um, and you just know that there's a lost opportunity there, not just for him or her, but for the person that they're speaking with, who expects a perspective, who expects a solution. Yeah. How would you respond to that and why? Oh, I've had that, by the way. I've had that where when I first took over a certain role, uh, my my immediate boss was an Englishman and he noticed that I didn't usually speak up when I was in a team, uh, even though I was quite senior in, in, in the group, but I shared my opinion with him outside of the group and he took me out for dinner um, when I had a trip to London and he said to me you know he said Tom look I think your ideas are really good I think you're switched on I would really appreciate you voicing those in the group because then I get the confidence that I have somebody else who's on my side of the fence in front of our colleagues so he positioned it that way so what I actually felt was if I raised my voice in a group I was doing it again to support my direct line manager, and I come from a I come from a lineage where I believe that I support my manager. You know, if I don't agree with my manager, it's never said in public. It's always our backyard. It's addressed on a one-to-one, -one, but never, never in a 
never in a forum of other people because I believe that's my backyard. That's my relationship with my manager. I should be able to voice my opinion, whether good or bad, especially if it's bad. I'll do it privately saying, you know what? I didn't agree with this. This was wrong. And and after that, how they react to it is up to them. But I've actually justified. I've stayed true to my emotions and I've stayed true to my voice. Yeah. Sometimes that has backfired in some other jobs that I've had where I've had no leader but a manager who's just been a dictator, you know, who's just said, it's my way or no other way. I'm not open to thoughts. Verbally, they might say, I'm quite interested in doing what you say, uh, Tagore. But you know that their ears are closed, not, their mind's not listening, and they just tick the box. You know, it's a KPI thing for them. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you cage your employees, you can't expect them to be free. Yeah. If you cage your employees, you can't expect them to contribute other than what you tell them to do. Exactly. There was an interesting, I found an interesting uh, uh, cartoon on, on LinkedIn. There's this, there's this individual, this, uh, I think he's a guy. Uh, so he makes cartoons around leadership related or business related topics. Yeah. So imagine a cartoon whereby you have two frames side by side. On the one hand, you see a uh, you see a tugboat, you know a tugboat, yeah, yeah. with, with uh, other boats, and you see that tugboat just making an enormous effort to move forward, and it says manager. On the other side, you see a lighthouse, no effort, just a light, a guidance. You mentioned it earlier, right? Yeah, perspective. What I mentioned, exactly. and you see boats uh, moving towards that 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 lighthouse, leadership. So, so in in many ways, I think, and then we didn't quite discuss this, but in many ways, if you if you are a leader or you decide to aspire to be a leader rather than a manager, you might find three things. I feel, and and I'd like your your perspective on as well number one you you you're making a lot less effort to move things forward and whatever the effort you do make is in terms of creating that guidance secondly you would find that people are willing to follow you as opposed to you have to drag them into a direction again the effort and i think the third thing is you actually get where you want to be as opposed to uh, day in, day out. And this has a, a little bit of a segue to mental health in my mind. Yeah. Uh, uh, trying to, if you're trying, you're trying and trying. And let's say that you're the manager, you're trying, you have no idea that you're actually being a tugboat, right? You have no idea. And this goes back to equality, uh, your original point, right? You have no idea that you actually selected the wrong boats. Or dare I say, you have no idea that you positioned yourself such that only the the tugboat variety would want to apply for a job with you yeah. as opposed to again equality as opposed to the folks who are actually hey I, I i buy into that perspective and i buy into that leadership yeah fair enough chris it's been great talking to you and I know we could talk for hours about this and I'm sure we will do on one of our coffee sessions and maybe we'll even come up with a follow-up podcast. I don't know, but we've got so much to talk about. It's been absolutely a pleasure to talk to you and get your thoughts about leadership, about equality and, you know, even applying it slightly to the, to the way the world is evolving today with the voice of Asia. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. It's my pleasure, Tagore. And uh, yeah, let's have that coffee. <laughs> yeah.